welcome to the Donut Bag Episode 2. Thank you for listening. Also, thank you for the positive feedback from the first episode. Um, It means a lot because if you didn't know this by now, I don't know what the heck I'm doing. I'm learning about this all on the fly Um, in terms of putting this together, recording, all that stuff. This is all very new to me, and I'm just learning um, about it. Um, I hope that this episode will sound a little bit better than the, than the first one. I know the first one had a few, uh, sound issues, so hopefully, um, I, that can improve, but like I said, I'm learning about this all on the fly, so hopefully it goes well. Coming up on this podcast, I talked to Lee Mowen from Dayton about the Cincinnati Bengals and the rest of the AFC North. Also, J.B. Errico, also um, he is known as Mike Zimmer's Ears on Twitter. We talk about the NFL offseason. And in the fans panel, I have Pip and Jeff Say, who actually have known each other for over 20 years and did a radio show um, many years ago. So let's get started. Okay, my first guest is Lee Mowen. He is a public address announcer and play-by-play man in the Dayton area, also a writer and host of a podcast called The Gem on the Queen's Crown. Lee, how are you? I'm doing great, Joey. How about yourself? Oh, not bad, not bad. Um, I noticed you went to Wright State University, and my wife went there too. Um, I've only been there once, but did they still have that – that um, network of tunnels underneath everything oh you know it i the only thing i don't know is there's been a couple new buildings that have been built on wright state i don't know if they have underground tunnels for that but yeah they still have those and a fun tidbit even if it was really cold or really hot when i went to school most of the time i'd still go outside yeah yeah it's like it's like it's a it's really interesting idea but yeah, maybe, I don't know. I don't know. Maybe we, we have a lot of uh, tunnels in Pittsburgh, but they're um, there for driving through. So um, it's really <laughs> weird that like everything's underground uh, there, and and uh, it looks like you could go. You just about use them for, to go anywhere there. Yeah, I mean everything's basically connected. I mean academics wise, because all the athletics play on the other side of campus, but. You can get to pretty much anywhere you want to go without stepping outside once you get to a major building. Interesting. Interesting. Yeah, it's it's a good place. I, I love Wright State. It's it's my alma mater. It's you know it's a place I go to work and I'm I'm pretty blessed to work at not only Wright State but also the University of Dayton and that's you know the closest D one school to Wright State. It's about twenty minutes south southwest. Okay. Awesome. Yeah. Okay. So about the Bengals, um, as a Steelers fan, the Bengals Steelers rivalry has been pretty intense the past few years. Um, how do you think they did this off season? It seemed like they didn't do very much, um, except maybe address their offensive line a little bit. You know, Joe, uh, I'll start with the coaching uh, because there was a time where everyone thought that, that, hey, Marvin Lewis, he's gone after this year. Hooray! And it turns out, nah, just kidding. I'm here for two more years. Originally, I was like, no, I don't want that. It's the same old stuff. But at the same time, he started making moves on the other coaches. We have a new offensive line coach, the the guy from Dallas. Uh, and I think our old coach, Alexander, is now in Dallas, so funny that. And the offensive line, like you touched, Billy Price with the first pick the Bengals had, I feel I feel like that's a really strong start. But, again, the games haven't been played yet. Who, who's to say, you know, Price is going to be a stud for all 16 games or he goes down with an injury game one. So I, I like to see this new offensive line, including uh, Cordy Glenn, that guy, that guy's a monster. He made Geno Atkins look, you know, minuscule. And just like, God, that's a big boy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, boy, they, the Bengals really are all about consistency. I mean, Lewis has been 
Um, this is this will be his sixteenth year. It's it's amazing the thing too. I mean, you gotta look at before Lewis. I mean, that's ugh, no one likes to talk about that. That, but he has changed the culture, and I feel like once we get to the playoffs, just getting to the playoffs isn't good enough. You have to actually get through the first round and stay with it type of thing. Getting to the playoffs isn't, you know, the big goal anymore. It's get further, punch forward. And I, I certainly hope that after the last few seasons, I certainly hope that Cincinnati's on the right track. But, Joe, I as as a Bengals fan, I'd, uh, I don't know. It's just, it, it's, they really have not changed much. You know, um, Andy Dalton is, he is what he is. Um, yep. AJ Green, still one of the best wide receivers in the league. But what else is there? That's the problem. Tyler Eifert, he's, he looks like he's hurt all the time. Um, it sounded like they expected big, big things from John Ross, and he didn't play at all. So, you know, it could be just a matter of just hoping people stay healthy and do something to take take the load off of AJ Green because he's really their only threat. I agree, and I hope this year is a better year for Ross because with what he was described as in the draft, he's going to be quick. I mean, if you have Green and Ross on the ends, that's that's pretty big right there. Eifert again, I, I saw somewhere that he might be going to the pop. And I hope not, because I really want to see Eifert do big things. But at the same time, you know, I don't know. And the running game this year, I I hope Mixon gets a chance to shine. I mean, if he commits to, you know, proving himself as a person and running back, I want to see him do great things in the stripes. Speaking of Mixon, the running backs, so Jeremy Hill is gone. Now you have basically Joe Mixon and Giovanni Bernard. Do you see Mixon taking the most of the load there, or is that going to be like a like a split situation? I feel like Bernard being the guy that's been Cincinnati the longest out of the two, I feel like he'll get the majority of them, and then Mixon will be mixed in. God, that's an awful pun. Um, <laughs> Mixon, mix, I, ugh, I, I feel embarrassed. Are you sure you want me as a podcast? I hey, I'm <laughs> I'm the king of dad jokes, so I love it. Hey, maybe I'm the only yeah. one, but I enjoyed it. I I I feel like Mixon will get his chances this year. I mean, you mentioned Hill being gone. He's a Patriot now, right? Yes. I feel like that gives Mixon Mixon an opportunity to get in there and be the big running back that we all want to see in Cincinnati. Now, is that going to happen? I don't know. I mean, it could be Bernard gets an injury in the first game and Mixon carries the Bengals to the playoffs, or it could be Mixon gets hurt and then, well, here's Bernard. So I want to see Mixon do big things. I also want to see Bernard be successful too. I feel like it, it'll almost be a 50-50, you know, a dual running back threat, but that's, you know, week one still a couple weeks away, which can you believe that football's almost here again? I'm just so happy. Even, even seeing people walk into, you know, just start training camp. I was just so happy to see any football again. I, I was watching flag football and, and ultimate Frisbee on TV. Like there has to be something else. Please, please come back football. It's too bad the Arena Football League isn't, you know, as strong as it was. We, I was actually talking to someone about that earlier today. It just, yeah, football coming back. I mean, high school starting up. I, Ohio starts a week later than Indiana, Kentucky, and I'm not sure about Pennsylvania high school football, but football's coming back and it's going to be huge and it's, it's an exciting time. So I'm, I'm happy to be able to get a chance to talk a little bit about it. Yeah, you know, they have this this XFL. I think there's one or two other football leagues coming up. I think people are so starved for, for football year-round now that if they wanted to play in the spring and early summer, people would watch it. I mean, I, my goodness, flag football? Are you, are you kidding me? There has if, if somebody put real football out there, they would be all about that. 
Oh, no, no kidding. I mean, football's king in terms of sports. I mean, with the suggestions, not suggestions, but the conversations and training camp starting. And by the way, I love the videos you share on Twitter. I just, St. Vincent College, that place looks beautiful. Is there a um, farm in the background? Oh, yeah. Yeah, it's basically in the middle of just farmland um, in, in Latrobe, PA. Um, yeah, that was my first time there uh, yesterday. Oh, my gosh. It was so gorgeous. It was just, and it was just like, you know, the, the weather was perfect. It was sunny and it's just, it's just really neat. They just let you go out there and just, just pick a spot in the hill and just, just watch them practice. And, uh, it was, it was perfect. And that's, that sounds awesome. I mean, I'm pretty jealous on that. Just, that's a beautiful scenery. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, it was really cool. Um, so about the defense, um, Vontez perfect. Once again, suspended. This time he changed it up a bit. Instead of being suspended for conduct, he was suspended for, for a drug thing. Um, how does the defense – unfortunately, they've had a lot of practice being without him for various reasons. How does the, how does the defense do when, when Vontaze Perfect is not there? It's not the same. I wish there was a way where we could separate Burfick's, you know, game. Like the way he plays – football with the exception of you know some of the things he does and then take all the other stuff out and just have him play pure football i mean he does help the defense but at the same time he's doing so many things that are just like why are you still doing these things isn't the suspensions enough i mean the the drug suspension that that kind of makes me raise my eyebrows on that i mean but the Bengals are going to have to play defense with or without them, and they'll be okay, I feel. Like I said, probably my favorite Bengal defensively is Geno Atkins, and Carlos Dunlap I read just a couple minutes ago that he wants to retire a Bengal, so that's pretty huge. There's always improvements that Cincinnati's defense can have, but I feel like if Burfitt keeps his head in the game and doesn't – commit too many personal infractions, I feel like he adds a lot to the Bengals' defense. But at the same time, I feel like the defense also needs to have a game plan like, hey, perfect's not going to be here. We got to, you know, play like he is on the field. I I, I don't know if I answered that question well or not, but it no, just – No, that's that's fine. And I am, I am on the record as – Hating him more, almost more than any other human being on the planet. Um, I I know he, he he he. It seems like he intentionally tries to injure people, but I think the league is on to him, and they will go after him for every little thing. Um, it reminds me a lot of what happened with James Harrison a few years ago, when James Harrison was at the peak of his career, but he was just killing people just just injuring people all over and and just being vicious and the league would crack down on him for every little thing and he actually changed his game because of that because because of all the the crackdowns i think i think vontez is going to try to do that i mean like this you know the drug thing is you know, who knows who knows what's going on with that but i i, I kind of started to see that last year that he kind of changed his game and try to try to um uh, not, try to avoid trouble. Um, so yeah. hopefully he does that because it just seems like he tries to go out there intentionally injured people, and I just hate that. I do too, and I hope that you know he stays on the field as long as he can because his talent is sublime. But the other stuff is like, I uh, don't know if I like that. I I don't. But yeah, the- I hope I I hope. The future is bright for Burfick. That's that's what I hope. There's always that that age old question of you know somebody that's that's a that's vicious or whatever, and you know you hate him when he's playing against you, but but if he was on your team, you would probably love him. Yeah, I I, I kind of agreed on that. It's just there's there's being aggressive and playing you know playing insanely, and then there's you know doing stupid things 
And I feel like if Perfect can get behind the play of being stupid, you know, I feel like, again, he'll be a big part of Cincinnati defense. Yep. Yep. So what do you see record wise for the Bengals this year? Record wise, hmm. If everything goes right, I feel like the Bengals will have a decent shot for the wild card. I want to tell you that the worst I see is two games under 500 at seven and nine. Well, no, that'd be two games under 500. Yeah. Yeah. I, and, I, and that's what math. they were last year too. Instant math. What is this? <laughs> I feel like, I hate saying that I feel like they'll be seven and nine, but if Marvin Lewis has it has this team and changes up the culture again, I feel like the Bengals will get a wild card, and I might see them at nine and seven. If everything turns out well, maybe even ten and six. I mean, that's the highest I'll probably go. Yeah, yeah, I I I like that range. Basically, either. Seven and nine, eight or eight or nine and seven, I think is basically their their likely range because you never know what could happen in a game. Last second field goal, bounce here or there or something like that. So I think if things go right, maybe nine and seven, ten or six. But if things don't go so right, then seven or nine and eight and eight. So yeah, I, I, I'm in agreement there. Um, as far as the other teams in the AFC North, um, let's go let's go to the, uh, Cleveland. They made a ton of changes uh, in the off season. Where do you think? They're, they'll they'll do this year. You think they'll actually win a game? You know, I really hope so. I might not be the biggest Browns fan out there. I mean, I'm a Cincinnatian. I mean, Cincinnati is my second home. Dayton's my first. But I want to see the Browns do well, and I feel like these additions are going to be great. But then again, you go 4-0 in the preseason, and then you drop an 0-16 egg, and it's like, God, I I want to see the Browns do well. I feel like these changes are in the right way. I mean, I like the pickup of Taylor. Also, that first round pick, I I don't know if I'll like that or not. I don't know how well he'll do, but I feel like the Browns will not go one and fifteen or zero and sixteen again. Uh. And I can probably see them getting five wins, six wins, seven wins if things turn out well for them, but I don't know. They're, the pickups sound great, but who knows how well they'll do for Cleveland. Who knows if they'll make Cleveland better. It, proof's going to be in the regular season, and I feel if Cleveland plays every game tough – They'll get close to 500. I'm not seeing eight and eight this year, but I feel like the future's on the right path for the Browns. Yeah, yeah. I um, I did a poll a week ago, and I basically said, "Do you hate the Browns or do you just pity them?" And I think it was like 80 percent said, "We we just have pity for them. We feel sorry for them." When I was younger. The, the Browns and Steelers were a great rivalry, and we hated each other. And then they, they, you know, the team moved to, to Baltimore, and they, you know, and then the Steelers Ravens were a great rivalry. But now, like, you know, it's just you just feel bad for them. Um, I, I, I think they're on the right track, and I agree with you. Maybe probably five or six wins, you know, which is still a huge improvement from last year. And you know, maybe it'll show that they're on the right track, and they actually. Tried to figure it out for once. Um, so we'll see. I, I hope so, too. I mean, like you mentioned, Cleveland-Pittsburgh back in the day, that was that was the rivalry. I mean, this is during the – this is after the Cincinnati time, but that was the big rivalry, and the Bengals were just kind of like, you know, it was kind of like the void. Or if anyone from <laughs> Southwest Ohio knows Forrest Fair Mall, that's literally an empty big slate with Bass Pro in it and just – it was like that. It's a big empty canvas, and it's supposed to be great, but pff, there's nothing in there. Yeah, yeah. Um, what about the Ravens? I I don't. I mean, they're they're mm. kind of in the same boat as the as the Bengals. It's like you're just kind of in the middle. Like we, I don't. It's like maybe maybe seven or nine, maybe eight or eight, maybe nine or seven, but they just seem like they're just. 
just in the middle. Yeah, I agree with Baltimore being in the middle. I mean, I feel like Flacco's time is running out. They have Lamar Jackson coming up. I mean, he's going to get a chance to shine with the Ravens. I I don't know. I Every time I think the Ravens are going to do something pretty well, have a good season, I just feel like, you know, Baltimore always just, you know, I don't know. Plays just middle of the road. So I, I'm, I feel like the Ravens will probably be third or if Cleveland, you know, just shocks the world even fourth. I feel like the Ravens are bottom half of the North. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the, the Ravens and the Browns took huge gambles with their quarterback picks. We'll see. I mean, I've, I've heard so much from, from quote unquote experts as to why uh, Baker Mayfield and Lamar Jackson are going to be great and also why they're going to be terrible. So we'll see. They've taken huge gambles and we'll, we'll see how it works out. Big thing is you can say anything you want on paper, but you're still playing the games on the field. And until they get a chance, it's all speculation. So I can't believe I forgot Baker Mayfield's name while I was talking about the Browns. So <laughs> I, I'm sorry about that, but I feel like, you know, those will be the quarterbacks of the future, and I, I do like Pittsburgh's draft of Mason Randolph, too. I feel like he's going to be the future Steelers quarterback after Big Ben retires. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I think this, the Steelers didn't plan on drafting a quarterback, but when they saw that Mason was available – they said we we they we have no choice. We've got to take this guy. I mean, it's not often that the Steelers get a chance to take a you know potential really good quarterback. You know, with 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 where they usually draft. Um, so, what do you think about the what the Steelers are doing or how or how they'll do this year? I think another AFC North crowns awaiting the Steelers. I mean, you got Antonio Brown, and you still got Big Ben. I I hope he rebounds from next or from last year not next year i hope he rebounds from next year you know because you know, <laughs> from the like, future <laughs> for the future i mean the jacksonville game where he threw five picks i mean i was thinking you know that's kind of heading to the stop sign of his career but he's coming back this year i Unless Cincinnati really gets down to business, I, I don't see Pittsburgh being dethroned in the North this year. And yes, I, I know there's going to be Bengal fans who are like, hey, "You doing yeah. <laughs> I know because that's you know that's you know a voice I do, but no. <laughs> Antonio Brown. I mean, you got Le'Veon Bell still, and I, I know that off off season drama. You know that's there but i feel like once bell starts heating up he's tough to stop i still love that the steelers have a tight end named jesse james that's that's great he's <laughs> he's still Keith miller but at the same time he's all right yeah i mean pittsburgh isn't as strong as the iron curtain days let's you know let's get that out of the way but pittsburgh's also you know how how many years in a row have they taken the north I'm not sure T too <laughs> too many. Uh, I I can't I can't wait to see Bengals Steelers, but at the same time, unless one of the three other teams shocks the world, I I see Pittsburgh taking another North crown. Yeah. I, I agree. And this is I think this is their last best maybe their last best chance because this this will be Le'Veon Bell's last year. That's you know, the the, the conventional thinking um, so, I mean, and yeah, Ben is, he's, he's old already. So, and he's just going to get older. So this might be the Steelers last, uh, shot at, at, uh, winning the division, going to the Super Bowl. So we'll see. We will see. It's, it's going to be a fun year for football though. I'm, I'm excited in Cincinnati. We have Dan Horde broadcasting the Bengals games he also does UC football the Bearcats football so it's kind of cool you get to hear him same station call college and then NFL right off the bat I, I don't care if the Bengals are 16-0 or 0-16 I'm listening to the games when I can and I 
I wouldn't trade it for the world. I love – there's something about listening to sports on radio, and I know that's not what we're talking about, but I can't wait to listen to it. A good play-by-play team, uh, announcer or a good uh, announcer and a commentator, they just make the game so much better. Even even if the game isn't that good, they make the game really good. So, yeah, I agree with you there. I mean, the Reds this year, I mean, you know, Pittsburgh kind of sank their battleship, you know, start off, you know, after the All-Star break. But who would have think this Reds team would, you know, be making this much noise after starting 3-15 and 15 and 3-18 and 18 after firing Brian Price? I mean, if Marty Brenneman's on the radio, I know he said some things that, you know, make other fans mad, and I get that. But Marty on radio to me is is the voice of summer here in southwest Ohio. Man, how long has he been doing it? He is a legend. Early 70s? I think 70... It was before the Big Red Machine. Wow. It was, I want to say 72, but I'm not I'm not sure. He turned... Oh, he had his birthday yesterday, and I forget what... Oh, how old he is now, but I'm going to be sad when Marty hangs up the headset for good. Yeah, yeah, those those broadcast legends. I I I was so sad when Vin Scully um stopped stopped calling games because to me he was just such a legend. He was he was the storyteller. Yeah, yeah, amazing. Well, Lee, thank you so much. Um. Thank you so much for doing this, Lee Mowen. Um, you have your own podcast, uh, The Gem on the Queen's Crown, uh, public address announcer, play-by-play man in Dayton. Thank you so much for doing this. No problem, Joey. Um, one day, I promise, I'll have you on my podcast. If people actually like the things that came out of my mouth, I talk <laughs> Cincinnati and sports, and not just you know the big teams. I talk about, I try to cover you know the sports that aren't always covered around here i mean the dragons having the sellout streak they have which i think is over 1300 games in a row now but there's a lot of great things about cincinnati and dayton ohio and me being around here i want to share those with the world so if, if you know if you don't if you didn't find me annoying on this segment you know check it out be cool but <laughs> Joe, it's it's been a pleasure. Good luck to your Steelers this year, and I can't wait to see more vids from St. Vincent College. Uh, I I like the scenery out there, but you know it's football season. It's great to see all this happening, and thank you for you know giving me a shot on here too. Hey, no problem. Yeah, just so glad football's back. So, all right, thanks a lot, Lee. No problem, Joe. Take her easy. Okay. Bye. Okay, my next guest. You may know him as Mike Zimmer's Ears on Twitter. JB Erico, how you doing, man? Hey, what's up, Joey? How are you? Pretty good. Okay, I got to know, why Mike Zimmer's Ears? That is the question everybody asks. Um, about four years ago now, back when Zim got hired, I was looking for a kind of a Twitter account to pay homage to the Vikes, and I, I just happened to see a picture of Zim, and the picture with his hat, the ears were just so prominent. And I said, you know, why not? There's so many parody accounts out there. I said, Mike Zimmer's ears. And then you can a little play on it. Like I'm here to listen, you know, to everybody. So I just kind of went with it and it took off like crazy. I mean, it, every, I am MZE now. I don't even have a name anymore. <laughs> pretty, pretty soon people are just going to think your actual name is Mike. Yeah, oh, and I've been called Mike several times already. <laughs> my, my children are like, Dad, who's MZE? It's like, <laughs> it's, well. my, it's my It's my superhero name, kids. Yes, it, it is. It, that is my superhero name. <laughs> <laughs> so how glad are you that we're actually ta- able to talk about football, even if it's training camp? Oh, Joey, Anytime. I mean, football has become a 12-month-a-year sport now. It is, there really is no off-season. You know, you, you've got the camps, but the, the draft in April, and, and it's become such an event where they spread it out now over three days. Uh, there's always something to talk about in, in the NFL anymore, and I love it. I think it's fantastic. So it is great, though, to, to know that next week we actually have 
teams taking the field and playing the game. Yeah. Yeah, um, I was just talking to the uh, previous guest. Um, you know, you, they have – I mean, the NFL Network is showing flag football. It, it, at this point, we're so starved for football. You know, these, these leagues that might pop up, like XFL and who knows what other league might pop up, if they ran – Early spring and uh, spring and early summer, they would do just fine and get lots of ratings. People are that starved for football. I, I watched the you know the American Flag Football League uh, tournament. I thought it was fantastic. And you're right, it's just like this is football. I mean, it's it's a different version, but it's still football. It's still passing, running, throwing the ball. It, it, it's fantastic. I love it. Yep. Yep. So. Let's look at some of the things that are some of the big changes that happened in the off season. One of them is a lot of teams changed quarterbacks. Um, Kirk Cousins is now with the Vikings. Uh, Sam Bradford is with the Cardinals. Uh, AJ McCarron is with the Bills. Alex Smith is now with the Redskins. Who do you see as maybe being the most successful out of all the new uh, new quarterback situations? I'm probably going to sound like a homer here, but it's based on the weapons he's got. I mean, Cousins is coming into a team where we've got probably at least one of the top three wideout combinations in Thielen and Diggs. And then you give him a big target like, you know, Rudolph at tight end. He's coming off of Reed, who plays like three games a year of, with the talent. It's just so much talent, and then you throw Dalvin Cook back into the mix. I think Cousins is set up for the most success. Got to be careful with that Viking offensive line, though. You know, Keenum was good last year because he's mobile. I don't think Cousins is as mobile. But overall, I really like the weapons he has. If I'm looking for a kind of a non-Viking guy, I'm keeping an eye on Tyrod Taylor. That guy's just a dual threat. He did so much with Buffalo. I don't think he was appreciated as well in Buffalo. Uh, and, you know, with Gordon coming back and now they added Landry, that could be an interesting team to watch this year. They, they're definitely not an 0-16 team anymore. Yeah, the, the Browns, I I have to agree. I think they're really going to surprise some people. Um, you know, you bring up Tyrod Taylor, and, and that makes me think of their offensive coordinator, Todd Haley, who is with the Steelers. He did a very good job with the Steelers, and – you know, that combination might be very good. Oh, I think so. I, I definitely agree. You're looking at a much better team now in, in Cleveland. They've made some great moves there uh, in the offseason, and Taylor's just the one guy that nobody really talks about. I mean, because you, you draft Mayfield, and that's who he's going to talk about, he's going to sit. Unless Taylor gets hurt or really struggles, Mayfield may not see the field this year. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Let's talk about the rookie quarterbacks because there were. This was a very big um, rookie draft class. Baker Mayfield in Cleveland, Sam Darnold uh, in the New York Jets, Josh Allen with the Bills, Josh Rosen with the Cardinals, Lamar Jackson with the Ravens. Who do you think out of all of them is going to actually play the most and have the most success this year? Well, I look at traffic jams when I get to this, and Josh Allen seems to have a wide open passing lane because, I mean, A.J. McCarron eh, didn't really get a chance, I guess, in Cincinnati, but he's an Alabama quarterback. I, when was the last time an Alabama quarterback came out and shined in the NFL? And Peterman, I don't know what they see in that kid. I, I think Allen's the one who's going to have the best chance of success, the best chance of seeing the field early. I love Lamar Jackson, and I hope he gets a chance. I hope they don't try to convert this kid to a wideout or a running back. Really, really like to see what he can do, you know, out of with some RPOs. Uh, as far as Darnold goes, he falls into that other USC quarterback. Eh, I don't, I don't get excited over them. Um, Rosen might get a shot because Bradford's, you know, he's about as fragile as a leg lamp back there. Uh, it, it could be Rosen, but I'm going to go with Josh Allen. I'm drawing a blank. Who did the uh, Jets get also? The the guy from the Vikings that was hurt. Teddy Bridgewater. Teddy and Bridgewater, they yeah. Him, but they're uh, looking to trade him. Oh, really? I Oh, yeah. okay. Never mind. I, I thought he was going to – I mean, I thought it was just a, a shame that he got that injury with the Vikings. But I thought, you know, 
he was getting pretty good, and you know it's it, it's I'm I, I thought he would do well th- with the Jets or wh- whoever he ends up with, but and, and he might stay with the Jets. I know it's just a talk that they're looking to move him, which I think that would be a bad idea. I'd rather see him stay uh, than McCown. But uh, yeah, the, the Teddy injury that was just such a freak thing, and and. Just the fact that this kid's even on the field again after that is amazing. You know, he, from what I know, he almost died. So My goodness, that's how wow. serious that injury was. <laughs> wow. Yeah, that was that was that was horrific. Um, yeah, yeah. The Bills. I I, I just remember AJ McCarron being. Uh, rarely he would play for the. You know, there were times when Andy Dalton would get hurt and AJ McCarron would be in there, and he was awful and yeah i i i nathan peterman um i'm a huge university of pittsburgh person and i saw him play a bunch of times i i agree i don't i don't know what they see in him and then that he had like one of the worst games of any quarterback in the history of the league i yeah i don't i don't know and you know i i feel bad because we you know we have we have friends that are huge uh bills backers but they are getting you know killed in the uh in the off-season predictions because, you know, Josh Allen might be good maybe long-term, and you're right, he probably will get the most playing time this year. But yeah, who knows how that's all going to shake out. But just, there's not a whole lot of competition there for, for Josh Allen. It seems like he no. would have the, the, the easiest path to actually being a uh, starter. Yeah, and that's exactly where I went with this. I, I looked at it and I said, gee, you know, you're putting two – Two guys in front of him that really never did anything, and I, again, I, I just don't know what the Bills see in those two guys. But I, I really am looking forward to watching Josh Allen play. I, I honestly am. I, he's mobile too, which nobody talks about. He's always got his arm. He's pretty mobile. Yeah, yeah. It, it could be one of those situations where they just see that he's <laughs> that he just has the potential and just just puts him in right away. That's that's that that could be very likely what happens. Yeah, I think so. Right now, if if you were to say like the top 5 teams right now, what what would you what would your top 5 look like? You, you know, you have to go with the defending Super Bowl champs, the Eagles, and they're getting back Wentz at some point. You draft a tight end and and go to Goddard, I'm not really sure the pronunciation, but this kid's freakishly talented. Then you go, you have Jay Ajayi, and Adams out of Notre Dame, I think, has some solid potential back there. Uh, I really kind of like this Jordan Mylotta kid. Uh, I don't know if he's going to make it, but he's an interesting seventh rounder. If you've ever seen the, the video of this kid, he's a monster. He played rugby, and he just got all kinds of size and, and abilities. That'd be interesting to see. Um, my two team, I'm going to be a homer again. I think the Vikings did nothing to make themselves worse at all. You add Cousins, uh, you re-sign Hunter to an extension. Mike Hughes I like out of UFC or UCF. Um, Sheldon Richardson is a nice pickup. He's going to help those end edge rushers. He's going to clog up the middle. And uh, your boy Brian O'Neill I like too. I really do. I think this kid, if you put some weight on uh, I think he he got some ability back there. I mean, you know, they used to run tackle arounds with him, not tight end around tackle around. That's how good this is. Yeah. Uh, my three. This might surprise people, but I like the Saints. Um, anytime Drew Brees is back there, I mean, this is a team that is only missed the NFC title game because Marcus Williams just looked awful on the Minneapolis Miracle. Uh. And he's a good kid. I mean, he, he's got talent. He just made a bad mistake in that play. Uh, Kamara, I think, is going to be good. And then you're going to get Ingram back after four games. Von Bell, Cam Jordan, Michael Thomas is a beast. And, you know, you give Breeze just a couple of weapons, and, and he's going to light you up. My fourth team, and I hate saying this one, and you know who it's going to be, Joey. The uh, Patriots. The shall not be named. Yeah, yeah. The Voldemort of the NFL. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> You know, for whatever reason, you can give Tom Brady just – they just put players out there that you don't think are anything, and he just works with them. They, they really know how to build a team, and, and it's a team concept. It's Kenny Britt, I think, could be good. Dorsett that they added in the offseason. Cordero Patterson, 
really has some skill. I, I maybe you know they can figure out how to get it out of him. If Sony Michelle can hang out, hang, you know, hang on to the ball, I think uh, they're going to have a solid running game. And again, you know, whoever Belichick puts in the backfield seems to do well. I mean, Ben Jarvis Green Ellis ran well for them, for God's sake. And then my five, I'm going to give a shout out to the Indians. I, I really like the Steelers. I like the Steelers. And everybody's going to say, oh, where are the Jaguars? The Jaguars are being run by Blake Bortles, and I cannot get behind this kid. I tried. I just can't. But, you know, the Steelers are filthy talent with at the skills position. Big Ben lost weight. He looks like an actual athlete for a change. <laughs> uh, you know, Antonio Brown, if, if Le'Veon takes the field, you're good. Um, I love Juju. Juju's fantastic. And they beefed up their secondary. And with the draft, you got Edmonds out of Virginia Tech, Marcus Allen, who I really like out of Penn State, and uh, Morgan Burnett, the free agent signing from the Packers. I mean, this team then uh, made some good moves. I think the Steelers are still a top five team. I, I really can't put a Jaguars team that beat them twice last year ahead of them. And that's really odd. It's just I can't believe in Blake Bortles. You cannot make me believe in Blake Bortles. I I am so in agreement. That's that's it's like yeah, it's it's Blake Bortles. And I know the the Jaguars put what for, scored 45 points on the Steelers, but it's like come on. It's Blake Bortles. You can't <laughs> compl- you know, yeah, exactly. Um I I had a similar thing. My mine, mine was just in a different order. Um I did have Philadelphia first, I the Patriots second. Um, instead of the Rams at three, um, instead of the pa- Saints at three, I had uh, the Rams. Um, they, I mean, they were pretty good last year, and they made some pretty big additions. Yeah, they did. They, they, and, and you know, I, I I toyed with the Rams, but I kind of figured anybody's picking the Rams. And I still don't believe in Jared Goff. To be honest with you, uh, I'm probably going to be wrong here. They are a very good team. They they they're probably like they're easily a top a top six. <laughs> Yeah, and then yeah, I had um, I also had the Vikings um, at number four and the Steelers number five. Um, have you ever been able to go to a training camp, or is that the, the teams even do that anymore? I don't think I don't, I don't think they like. There's only eleven teams left that I think actually do you know a thing where where they'll go somewhere to to a training camp. I think they mostly just do it in their in their own facility. I have never been to one, and, you know, the Eagles are pretty close, but I really don't want to see the Eagles. Uh, <laughs> I'd love to catch a Vikings camp. I'm actually getting out there for a game for the first time ever in October. But, uh, no, I've never had had the opportunity to go to a camp. Uh, I think that would be kind of neat to see, though. Um, yesterday was the first time I've ever been to Steelers training camp, and it was so cool. It was just, it was just such a neat experience. It was just, it's, it's basically they, they go to St. Vincent College, which is basically in the middle of nowhere, and you just, they, you, do, you can just sit anywhere you want. It's like here's a giant hill, go sit where you want, and, and you watch them practice, and it was, uh, it was really cool. It's, it's kind of like Field of Dreams. It's like it's just, it's just in the middle of nowhere. That's awesome. That, that that really sounds cool. I would love to do that sometime. I'm not, maybe I will. Maybe I will at some point. You know, uh, I'm starting to do some different stuff, travel a little bit. So, yeah, I think I probably will uh, try and get out and see. Maybe I'll meet Zim. That would be pretty cool. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> Touch his ears. <laughs> oh, you have to. <laughs> <laughs> um, did you hear about – this was kind of a, a big deal around here. Antonio Brown, the, 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 they came in, I believe, last Wednesday or Thursday, and th- there's always a big thing about how they, they – they, the players try to make elaborate entrances into uh, when, they, when they go to training camp. And Antonio Brown came in in a helicopter, and people f- freaked out. I don't understand why, but they they didn't like that he was so flamboyant that he would come in in a helicopter. Does, have you heard of any other players making a big deal about how they made made an entrance into into training camp? No, I, I really haven't, and I just thought it was very cool that Antonio Brown took a copter into camp. Yeah. Listen, if you can do it, do it. Yeah. If you're doing your job on the field. I don't care what you – you want to 
buy a space shuttle and fly in, that's fine as long as you're doing your job on the field. Exactly, okay. and he, oh my goodness, even in even um, what I saw in training camp, um, it was he. he, he I don't care who the defensive back is. He just makes them look bad, no matter, regardless of the situation. He is just insane. Well, um, I think they had the top 50 catches last year. There was a video I saw. He had six of them. He had six of the top 50 catches of the season. Nobody was even close to him. That's that's ridiculous. He is something to watch, and he's not huge. He just gets the ball. I mean, he's fun to watch. I just love watching the guy. The great thing about him is he's basically a self-made person. He was a sixth-round draft pick, you know, didn't have the pedigree. Um, I think he came to, from Central Michigan or something like that, so not a big mm-hmm. school. He basically made himself, you, you know, just through hard work and, and ability, you know, what, what, what he is, and that's just – it's just amazing, and, and that's the thing is he works harder than anybody else, any other any other player on the team. He works harder than them, and you know he so he sets a great example that way. So yeah, however he wants to come in, you want to come in like you said, space shuttle, parachute, whatever. Parachute's probably next year. Yeah, but that might be his next one. He will he will either that or he will fly in on a zeppelin. <laughs> yeah, I've, cool. I've also heard that. Yeah, coming on a blimp. <laughs> That would be pretty awesome, too. But I, I love those guys. I love stories like that. I mean, we have one in Minnesota, and Adam Thielen, who I watch play special teams, and uh, I just love him from the start, too. You know, he, he'd get in on just a few plays. They'd run him on an end around. I said, he's pretty quick. I said, I love this kid. And now look at him. He's one of the best receivers in the league right now. And he just, he's a worker. And I love guys that go out there and work at their craft. I always root for them. Yep. All right, sir. Thank you very much. Um, you catch him on Twitter, Mike Zimmer's ears. He, uh, you are about as mu- as much of a Twitter user as I am, which is basically twenty four seven. So <laughs> you're always on there. So um, hey, thanks a lot for doing this. Oh, this was great, Joey. Anytime. You you are so fun to talk to. I love meeting you on Twitter. I think this is great. I love it. Awesome. All right, have a good one. Thanks, Joey. Okay, now on to our fans panel. We have two people on this week. Um, they are basically known as Pip and Jeff Say. Guys, how are you? We're good. Good. How are you doing, Joey? Thanks for having us on. Appreciate it. Oh, no problem. So you guys know each other already. How how do you know each other, and how long have you known each other? Uh, I, I want to go on um, probably about 22, 23 years. We started at Clarion uh, about 1997. We went we went at a small AM slash carrier current sta- station at Clarion WCCP. Uh, Jeff went on to the FM station, and I kind of stayed back at the AM station because um, at Clarion at the time there there was a lot of interest in both stations and kind of covered both bases, and it was really kind of a nice option to have friends in, in both stations. So we kind of continued on from them. He took on a show at, at the FM station. And I did guest spots, and, and uh, we both supported each other throughout college on both stations. And I learned a lot about broadcasting, thanks to Clarion University. And we're enjoying being on your show right now. Awesome. Yeah, I think that just about covers it. And I, we started, I think it was actually 96 is when we first met. And we worked together for a couple of years at WCCB, uh, both as music directors in some shape or form. And that was really a great, great opportunity to work with A&R groups from record labels. And we just got an opportunity to learn all behind the scenes. And then as Pip said, I went to WCUC, the Clarion FM station run by the college. And I had a radio show there that we were the original freak show. So I always joke with him. That when we hear uh, Big Bob and Mikey from the Freak Show on ninety six point one, I'm like, oh man, they took our they took our thunder because that was that was our show twenty years ago, and we always had a rotating cast of characters, but there was no more entertaining character than Pip, and I was always the straight man, as it were. Okay. 
Okay, so on to the Steelers. We finally have some actual football to talk about, and not. It's. it's I'm just starved for football, and it seems like it, it was forever until we could actually talk about football. I agree. Um, I'm happy to see. I, I'm getting tired of. I think. Twitter, it kind of twists itself to more of a negative environment. I'm, I'm finally happy to see a little bit of a positive spin. Eventually, everybody's going to get to that angry level of, oh, it's Steelers season and, oh, they lose a game. But I think the Steelers are kind of the stalwart of Pittsburgh tradition where, you know, yeah, NFL can go through its trepidations of its manifestations of different items and different controversies and everything. But I think the Steelers are the consistent – team in Pittsburgh that it's more about hanging out with family and friends and being there just to enjoy a game on a Sunday afternoon and I'm just happy to have that positive vibe back, you know? And there's been so much negativity around the NFL and we hear about all the drama and all the controversy as you mentioned and the fact that it's just now we're getting to the point where we can talk about the actual product on the field and talk about quarterback ba- battles and who's going to start a wide receiver and what's going to happen with Le'Veon Bell. Is he going to come to training camp? Is he not going to come to training camp? What impact is that going to have on the team? I would much rather talk about that than who or who is not going to kneel when it comes to the national anthem. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Pip, you have a point. You know, the Penguins are one thing, and there's there, there's always the Pirates, and I think because of how poorly the Pirates have done over the last 20-some years, I think interest in them is not as high, and you know, the Penguins have been great lately, and there is, I think they're the clear number two, but I, I think in Pittsburgh, the Steelers, as far as right now and probably for a while, are the number one sport in town. I'd agree with that 100%. I think that the uh, Steelers are consistent. I mean, I was in other towns in the 80s where, you know, the Steelers were not as good, and I recognize that fact. You had 30 years of, you know, quarterbacks, and you had different players come in and out, and they were not a consistently winning franchise. When you talk about the handoff from Noel to Cower to Tomlin, you did have those. I, I'm not a, a rose-colored glasses guy. I remember – Sixth grade, I had to go to school the next day, and the Steelers had lost 52 to nothing to the Browns, or 54 to nothing. And I apologize for not knowing the exact number, but, you know, I had to watch that that section in time where the Steelers were not good, but you had individual players like Merrill Hodge that, was, that were fantastic. And you had, eventually, Jerome Bettis, Heinz Ward, and you could see these great players, and you didn't have that one force that was Ben Roethlisberger or is Ben Roethlisberger that could tie it all together masterfully. You had to watch, you know, a long time of average and below average quarterbacks. And I'm not going to get to the Cordell Stewart thing because I truly kind of think that Cordell Stewart gets a bad rap. I think he was great when he had a lead, but mentally he just couldn't play from behind when he, when the team but I do think he had his place in Steel history. I do think he deserves the respect. But it's interesting to see the Steelers, the Steelers being consistent from, I want to say, the mid to early 90s to now. And, and see them re-solidify themselves as a winning franchise. So there might have been a, what, a five or six year period there that the Steelers were playing 500 ball. And it was doom and gloom in Pittsburgh. But you got to think that was also about the same time that all the steel mills were leaving. So there was a kind of a dark cloud, no pun intended, over the city. And then it kind of reopened in the 90s when they started going towards the technology side of things and the city itself. And the Steelers had success with your Neil O'Donnells. And you mentioned Cordell Stewart. And depending on – I think we can look back on it now and, and call his era maybe a little bit better than what at the time everybody was really dumping on him. But then we're in the early 2000s when they drafted Ben, when they drafted Troy, when they were able to really turn around. I don't want to, I can't say turn around because they were in the Super Bowl in the 90s against the Cowboys. They probably should have won that game. So 
the Steelers have always been that consistent. And certainly I grew up as a, as a huge Pirates fan. Um, baseball is probably my number one love. I'm a, still a huge Pirates fan. But after 20 years of losing, you get beaten, get beaten down. With the Steelers, there's always hope. And there's always that expectation that they're going to be a winner, that they're going to be in the Super Bowl. They're going to be above 500. They're going to be in the playoffs. And I think that expectation of winning is what makes that franchise great. Yeah, I I think even in the 80s, back, you know, after the Super Bowls and, and when they were not very good, even then they were still the number one team in town. Um, and even even years where they go 8-8, eight and eight, which – Aren't aren't that often, or 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 when they don't do well, the the interest in the Steelers is still ridiculously high, just because just I mean just coming from the seventies, just just that that foundation of 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 interest, and I mean I th- I think they had I, I think they've sold out every game almost for the past forty years. Well, I think that's kind of earned with consistency. I think that when you look at Pittsburgh sports as a whole. You know, we're not going to look back at the Penguins and say, oh, the John McClary years, and oh, they almost moved to Kansas City and point a finger and go, well, they rebounded. Well, it was smart drafting. You had good leadership, good coaching. And I think consistency in this town was what brought the Steelers to the forefront of, of sports in Pittsburgh because at the time in the 70s, and, and I can speak to that having – been a part of it where you know my family had to relocate to another town and we had to find other ways i think it was a positive beacon of hope for people to look back at the city they love but they had to go elsewhere because there weren't jobs here you watched pittsburgh go from the number 10 populace to where it's at now and you, you as jeff you had said earlier the city is now coming back into meds and and, and, and other factors and banking. You watch it start to grow back again, but the Steelers have always been that consistent family driving, friends driving force where win or lose, this town when they lose goes gray. It could be a bright sunny day in September. It doesn't matter. The Steelers lost. But one thing, talk about the consistency Obviously, we have to mention the Rooney family because they are by far, in my opinion, the best ownership in Pittsburgh and possibly the best ownership in all of sports. Yeah. Yeah, and that has a lot to do with it. Uh, You know, about the Penguins, they're great now, but Pip, you bring up, you know, when they weren't so good and they weren't drawing so well, there will come a time when – Sidney Crosby and, Viga- and and Malkin are gone, and maybe the team won't be as good. What will it be like then? Will it be like the Steelers and the interest will still be high, or will it go down because the team won't do so well? We'll, we'll see what happens. I think it will go down. I remember going to games in 2002, 2003 after they drafted Flurry, and I, I remember one game in particular. Brent Johnson got into a goalie fight with whoever the goalie was for Florida at the time. And there might have been a thousand people in the stands to witness that. It was the tickets were cheap, the beer was cheap, it was still hockey, it was still fun, but the interest wasn't there. It wasn't until they drafted Sid, it wasn't until Gino came over, it wasn't until they started winning. And I think that once you see those marquee players leave, unless they are able to reproduce them or able to replace them with key names, we're going to see a little bit of a lull just because there isn't that consistency like with the Steelers. And I would agree with Jeff on that point. I think that it's – I think that's any market. I don't think anybody, especially with ticket costs going up, cost of – you know, you go to the the paint can and and you you have great food there. You have Permani Brothers. Same with the Pirate Stadium. Same with – but Pittsburgh has – great food there but it's on average a couple of bucks more you're dropping 200 bucks on a game 300 bucks on a game between tickets parking beer soda or pop what what, what have you and food to have a comfortable good time 
And nobody wants to see their city humiliated. I think that's a consistent goal around any sporting town in anywhere. I don't think anybody wants to go to a stadium or an arena and watch their town get humiliated by other towns, especially at elevated ticket pricing. I think the Penguins did a good thing, a smart thing. Jeff, say, if you can remember, in the 2000s, the student rush program, I think, was brilliant. It was. That's how I went in 2003. The, the, the cheap ticket prices of the Penguins saying, okay, we're not going to be that good, but hey, come on in, watch hockey. And I think that's where the X's and O's of hockey was ingrained in the city because you had the younger the younger crowds, the Gen X, Gen Y, millennials, that had that opportunity to come in and get familiar with the game of hockey. I don't see the Pirates doing similar things where they can, hey, come on in at a cheaper price. The Steelers are consistently good, therefore they can charge the premium. So if I'm sticking to the, the topic of the Steelers, I would say the Steelers are the stalwart, the Penguins have done great things, and I don't want to get negative, but I think other teams in the city have kind of fallen back in that mentality of their opportunities and failure. One thing about the Steelers as well, and I, I can speak to this in, in Virginia, is that it's a badge of honor when you wear your jersey out, when you wear your T-shirt out that says Steelers, and it's a conversation starter because there are expats from all over Pittsburgh that are down south, that are out west, that are up north, that are even further south than here. And the minute that they see your Steeler jersey, it's an ultimate connection, and you're able to have that shared experience. And I think that is what is amazing about football, but especially about the Steelers because – I don't see that with many other franchises because there's so much history tied to it and there's automatically a, a here we go as soon as somebody sees my jersey and it sparks up a friendship, you know, six hours away. Yeah, anytime I go out of town, I always wear Pittsburgh gear of some kind, usually Steelers, and almost always I get a favorable reaction. Um, one time I went to the Grand Canyon and I was wearing a Steelers shirt, and I, I'm guessing this lady was from Chinese or whatever, but she points at me and just says, Steelers! Steelers! So, yeah, it's, it's no matter where I go, there is that, that, that recognition. Um, even, I, heck, I was just in Cleveland a, a week or two ago, and it got a lot of favorable reaction, even, you know, even people saying, hey, go Browns, uh, but a, a lot of people just wanted to talk to me about the Steelers and, and how things are, so, yeah, it's it's like a, it's, it's like a conversation starter. It's amazing, because we were traveling back from the Outer Banks two weeks ago, and my father-in-law was ahead of us on 95, and he stopped, and he had on a Steelers hat, and this older lady approached him and said, are you a Steelers fan? And he's like, well, obviously, yeah, and she goes, I used to babysit Franco Harris's kids. Wow. And it was just um, just an amazing coincidence. And they talked for a little bit, and they were on their way to from New Jersey. But she was like, I was Franco's babysitter. And there's just those connections and that opportunity that everybody seems to have some connection to Pittsburgh and especially to the Steelers. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, Eventually, and I think that that time will come soon. Ben is not going to play. Ben will be gone. Who knows when? A year, a year from now, two years from now, three years from now, five years from now. It'll be interesting to see what the Steelers look like after him. If Mason Rudolph is the answer, if he's the heir apparent, we'll see. But about him, how do you guys see the backup quarterback situation working out? Do you see? Mason taking over for Landry and them just dropping Landry? Or do you see Landry staying, Mason being number three, and they either get rid of Josh Dobbs or throw him on the somehow throw him on the pack practice squad or have him come up with a phantom injury or something like that? How do you see that shaking out? Uh, well, I'm going to go – I think that from what I've read and seen on Josh Dobbs, I think he's a positive influence on the – Steelers culture. I think he is the kind of guy that you want to keep around based on the fact that, from what I've seen loosely on Twitter, and, and you know that can be construed how you want, he seems to have the drive to do positive things. And I think that 
is kind of the Steelers' mantra. And then and Mason Rudolph, we'll see. I mean, he's your prototypical Steelers quarterback, but so is Ken Graham. Um, I don't think to jump to conclusions to say, hell, he's the heir apparent to Ben. I think with the right timing, the right backup, because he will have talent his first couple of years. And the Steelers have consistently drafted well, and I don't want to say in the first round, but second, third, fourth, I mean, Antonio Brown was, I believe, a fourth round pick. Forgive my ignorance, I am not a sports writer by trade, and hopefully I don't get attacked for it. Sixth round. He was a sixth I round. Think, well, <laughs> sixth round. Well, well, was the sixth round pick. And you had Greg Lloyd back in the day when seventh round. I, th- I truly believe that you can get good talent later in the draft. And I, 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 I grow tired of the status quo of, oh, first round pick. They have to do things right now. I think that with a proper maturization of a third round pick that might produce later on, if you can sit there and set him on, on the bench and he can learn from a obvious Hall of Fame quarterback in Ben Roethlisberger, I think you could have his heir apparent if the timing is right. I think every Steelers fear, every Steeler fan's fear is that, you know, you have another 30 years of a doldrum between a Hall of Fame quarterback and another one, and you have this talent that gets flushed away in the process because they may only make it to the second round, may only make it to the third round. I, I, I don't know what the answer is anymore because you have seen great talent come from the later rounds of the draft. And I think that the stereotype that you have to draft your elite players in the first or second round has to be put in the back of your mind. I think that they did the right thing in drafting him in the third round because they do know that in the next couple of years that Ben, I believe he has said that publicly, he is one concussion away from retiring. And to his credit, I think that's the right answer. He's got kids. He's got a wife. He's got a life outside of football. And despite the machinations of what he was earlier in his career, and, and I've heard things positive and negative, and I'm not going to get into that. I, I think that the talent speaks for itself, and I think that learning from a guy who has been successful in the NFL should set a predecessor up, which, if you can remember the transition from Terry Bradshaw to Mark Malone, it was rough because Terry Bradshaw still felt he could play at an elite level, and Mark Malone had the UCLA pedigree. At, at what point in time, though, does that ego become damaging to helping the team? Because I see what you're saying, and I totally agree that I think Mason Rudolph could be groomed to be the heir apparent to Ben. But this isn't the same situation as 2004 when Ben was drafted and Tommy Maddox was was your starting QB. Because Tommy Maddox obviously was not the future. He was a stopgap. And when he got hurt and Ben came in, that was the end of Tommy Maddox, and this was Ben's team. That's not the situation with Ben and Mason Rudolph. However, it really bothered me when Ben bristled when Mason came in and said, you know, I'm drafted, I'm looking forward to, to learning from Ben, and Ben made some snide remark. His ego is easily damaged, and it that really gets under my skin because you would think you, you're leading a team, you're making millions of dollars, that you should be thankful that your franchise is looking to the future, adding someone in the third round. This isn't a first-round pick. This isn't somebody who's going to come in and take over immediately. I don't believe this is a Brett Favre and Rogers situation, but behind the scenes, I'm curious how Ben is handling it with Mason Rudolph. I think as far as this year's concerned, we're going to see Landry Jones as the main backup, as the number two. I think he's earned that. He had an 82% completion percentage last year. He's improved the past couple of years. But I don't see Mason Rudolph, you know, being more than a three to start. If maybe Ben is out more than a couple of games, if he's injured, then possibly Mason Rudolph gets more of an opportunity. But if he's out a game, maybe two, Landry Jones is your backup. He's going to be the one that gets the call. My Uh, argument to that is – I apologize, Joey, for stepping on you there. No problem. My 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 approach there is Landry Jones has been has been given opportunity, and if you're looking at the quintessential backup, my my stalwart would be Charlie Batch, and I, I believe that that Charlie Batch has been given and deserves credit for being a viable backup. Do you see 
Landry Jones even on the same playing field as Charlie Batch? No, but there is not a quarterback controversy with Landry Jones and Ben Roethlisberger. If you make Mason Rudolph the backup quarterback, all Yinzers are going to be saying all year long is, bench Ben, put in Rudolph, put in the rookie. They're already saying that, believe it or not. <laughs> I, I've seen that in dark corners of the internet. <laughs> I, I would say very dark because if you look at, at Ben's statistics, I don't think you're going to see a, a better quarterback uh, in a short term. In a short term, versus, uh, I, I'm just not a Landry Jones guy. I think he's been given too many opportunities, and I, I, I kind of think when you're in a playoff situation and you have to put a Ben in who's obviously injured and can only throw a 10-yard pass, but it's more accurate than your 30-yard pass. I think you have a situation where I, I truly believe I think that's why they should bring in a Josh Jobs. We have not seen him except in preseason form, and, and I won't doubt the, the talent scouts and the Steelers because obviously if I'm going to go on the Internet and, and even remotely try to compare myself to Kevin Colbert or anybody in, obviously in the first – office of the Steelers, it's not going to happen. But in my mind, I think you want to go younger and try to progress. That's me. I I think I agree with Jeff in that, let's say, I mean, Ben gets hurt every year. I don't think he's, it's, it's very rare when he plays all 16 games. He's going to be out for one or two or three games or something like that. If it's a very short-term thing, you stick Landry in there. Because, in, in, in you're right, Pip. He's Landry is Landry is what he is. He basically is. He's a he's he's at best a one or two game quarterback. That's it. But let's say Ben was down for six weeks or eight weeks or ten weeks or the rest of the year or something like that. Then you throw Mason in and and see what happens. Um, yeah, it's it's. May, Landry is what he is, and I agree. He'll probably be the backup this year. Be probably because he. I mean, it's a trust issue. This is a very veteran team, and if Ben did go down, you want somebody that that knows the playbook as well as anybody, and that that's Landry. Absolutely, I agree with you 100%, Joe. Even I think that Landry Jones is maybe a little underrated uh, in the Pittsburgh area because watching some of the backup quarterbacks I've seen closer to where I'm at in Virginia, watch some of the backup quarterbacks for the Redskins. I mean, Colt McCoy was terrible for the Browns and and now they're down here calling for him to start over Alex Smith who they just acquired because Colt McCoy has been here he knows the playbook Landry does know the playbook I think that does help him in terms of getting that call for the coming in and subbing for an injured Ben but I'm with you if Ben's out for six weeks or eight weeks then you go to Mason that's when you discuss the quarterback controversy, and that's when you uh, call in and talk to Stan. <laughs> <laughs> I, the, I, that's what I'm thinking in terms of Ben started out poorly last year. I forget which game was the Jacksonville game where he threw five interceptions, um, but really it wasn't until the Detroit game that he really got going, and then he and then he was fine. But let's say this year he starts out the first two or three or four games and isn't very good and isn't accurate and throws a lot of interceptions. How much do you think the Yinzers, the, 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 the fans, everybody is going to say, put in Mason, put in Mason. I think that's going to happen. And I think it's as, as long as Ben is here and, and Mason is, is a backup second or third string or whatever, I think we're going to hear that more and more. For the record, I think Ben was checked out early in the year last year. I don't know if it was all the talk, the concussions, or Bell holding out as long as he did. I heard some chitter-chatter that Ben's wife didn't want him to play last year. So I don't think he was totally – I'm with you. I don't think he was totally all prepared, and I think that Jacksonville game was a wake-up call because that's when people started calling for his head, and that's when he started turning it around. You mean you go, you go, you you go out there, you got Ben. I mean, well, you gonna have the heir apparent to him. I mean, he's gonna get old eventually. I don't, I don't agree with that mentality. I'm, I'm sorry. I, I, I think that Ben has earned his his bad games, so to speak. 
the Steelers played well into the, the second or third round. And there are franchises out there that haven't sniffed the playoffs in a decade. And, and you know, you edges are out there going, you know, I'm all, I want, you know, Josh Dobbs in there. Or I want Landry. I don't think anybody is going to go, oh, I want Landry in there. We've seen the Landry Jones show. I, I, I just, even as a backup, I don't think he has the skills to manage a game. I would like to see the younger talent come out, but I agree with the fact that, you know, Landry knows the playbook, and I, I believe he is a talented quarterback. And, and for me, a guy that was in the band that, that obviously is not an athlete, the second guess is, is kind of kind of, kind of of secondary to the fact that I can just enjoy a game on a Sunday. But just watching the results and, and – being able to see raw numbers, I just think that it might be time to see what the other two quarterbacks can do. I mean, if you can remember a T. Martin, if you can remember Charlie St. Pierre, if you can remember a lot of the third-string quarterbacks, they always had a young gun in there. They always had an, a, a veteran in there, and I don't think it worked out as well, especially when Ben got injured until you brought in a Byron Leftwich. And that, to Tomlin's credit, should be recognized, as he did bring in Byron Leftwich, but I can remember he just going – why is he bringing him? He's done not very good. I mean, you got T. Martin over there, and you got, you got a couple other guys. Why are you bringing in Byron Leftwich? I think that, to be said, there has to be a balance there, but I just think Landry's gotten the, the, the chance to show himself off, and he has won a couple of games, but I just don't see the victories piling up as I would for a Charlie Batch, and, and that's my opinion. I think Charlie Batch is a little overrated. Sorry, Joey. I think Charlie Batch is a little overrated. I think there's some rose-colored glasses because he's a Pittsburgh guy, and so everybody loves him. That brings up the question. So last year, they didn't. The, the offense did not start off well, and I think there is some merit to what you said, Jeff, about what 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 was going on with Ben that maybe he wasn't all dialed in. But it's almost the same exact situation as last year. Right now, the schedule, I believe, for Ben is he works a full day, then he works a half day, then he has a day off. And that seems to be, with a veteran offense, it seems to be the thing is is they hate training camp and they're just doing it, you know, just going through the motions it's like well don't worry we'll, we'll be we'll be ready for the regular season and either because Le'Veon is not there or 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 all those other factors it just seems like they're in for another starting off not as well don't sleep on that Ramon Foster injury too they're saying it's not too severe and he should be back in by the first or second week but if he's not 100 percent that is a kink in the armor of the Steelers offensive line I'm going to go and, and, and say that, that, you know, even back in the Cowery years, there was always talk of they're not prepared for the first season. And if you can remember, there was a stretch earlier in Cowher, Cowher's years. I, I forget the year. They played Kansas City. Baltimore wasn't strong. And, and they had a couple of weaker opponents in the first couple of games. And they lost to, I think, Detroit and Kansas City. And this town exploded because – they weren't to the talent level. I think that's kind of a of a of a, of a, a an excuse almost that oh they're they're veterans they need to be out there every day. I, I truly kind of agree with the fact that maybe Ben can read a defense and Ben can see film and Ben can can go and see his family. It was the same argument with Jerome Bettis. Jerome Bettis would would have a similar schedule where you know Jerome Bettis could hit the line, make the line move, and he could read his leads and he could read the defense and see where he was going. And he had the talent around him. And I, and I have no problem with an Antonio Brown, uh, a Ben Roethlisberger. Maybe on Bell's a different situation, but I'm not going to get into that. I, I think that the veterans do deserve a more conservative schedule because they may know the defenses and they may understand the NFL. I mean, Ben has proven himself time and time again, again to be an elite quarterback. He might be elite. Yeah, but I, I – now, the one big difference between last year and this year is this year they drafted someone, Mason, that I don't know that Ben's too happy about. 
And notice that Ben is in the quote-unquote best shape of his life. I don't know if that's a coincidence because he realized he needed to slim down or because he wants to really stick it to someone and say, oh, you drafted my heir apparent. Oh, yeah, well, screw you. <laughs> I think so. I think that's a great point. And we're talking about how the veteran players are getting a little bit of an easier time in training camp. That's just Tomlin's demeanor. That's the way he works. He rewards the guys. And frankly, I'm fine with that with Ben because we talked about his injury history. I don't want to see him getting banged up in the preseason. And I think preseason games are worthless. I would only rather play two. If I had my druthers, I'd cut preseason to two games. You have one game you play the starters, you get them ready. The second game they come out, they play the first half, and then they're out, and they're ready because they're getting the reps. They've been doing this for years. I would rather see that than see an injury and have somebody blow out their knee. I agree with Jeff Say on this one. I, I mean, you you consistently see in the NFL talk about player safety. You've got guys that, that may not make the team that should show their skills off because – say, a Cleveland or a Detroit or a Cincinnati or a New York Jets, or you have all these other franchises that have holes in their schemes of players that these guys might make the team. And I think a long-term goal of those guys is to make an NFL franchise. So why not show that skill off? Because let's say they cut Landry Jones and, you know, all of a sudden there's an injury in Minnesota and they need a veteran quarterback. Or if there's an injury in Carolina – and you've got a, a guy like a Josh Dobbs that is cut out like their quarterback that can step in there and might be a game manager there. We don't know the situations behind the scenes. So I truly think that preseason should be to the second string, third ring, third string guys because you've got to see what they're made of. And letting them sit on the bench, you may have a talented guy out there that Johnny Unitas – was cut by the Steelers because he didn't see his talent. But Baltimore picked him up, and he was a legend there. Who's to say that that situation isn't similar in some other franchise? Yeah, I, I think that I, I, I would imagine every team is is doing is having that philosophy of saying we play the starters not that much, but the Steelers take it to an extreme. I think the the starters play in the preseason like half a quarter, maybe the entire preseason. And yeah, I mean that is good because the thing is, you're not going to see a second or third stringer almost the entire year. We will talk about as training camp goes on. We will talk about some training camp darling that that just makes some incredible plays or whatever. And, it, and and then maybe they'll make the team or maybe they'll make the practice squad. And then we will never hear them again from, from them again. They will never see the field again, unless there's some blowout or something like that. So yeah, this is the chance for, for the second and third stringers to play, but the Steelers take that to the extreme. I don't even think it's, I don't even think it's half a quarter. I think it's like, like two or three series, maybe that. I agree. Yeah, I think so. I think, I think they do take into extreme, but I'm I'm okay with being overly cautious. And I can remember a few guys that we've seen come up from the second squad that has played. You know, Makovic played a little bit last year. Uh, obviously, when Shazier went down, we had seen him in the preseason. We knew what he could do. Uh, we've seen some of the offensive linemen step up in the preseason and show that they are capable. I think part of it is just not only building – that trust with the coaches and the fans, but is building that trust with your teammates and showing, hey, you know, in a game time situation, I can step up and I could be first squad if needed. Yeah, and I think that does speak to the success of the Steelers is there have been so many times where they have had to rely on a second or third string player and because they have that philosophy of hey you could be in you could be a starter any second now so always be ready that those players have done pretty well um in general it's the next man up philosophy i think that's uh should be the philosophy of any successful franchise is every part should be interchangeable because you don't know what tomorrow's going to bring yeah so I think I know the answer to this already, but Des Bryant is still out there. 
Is that someone the Steelers should even think about picking up? No. no. <laughs> <laughs> That's what Universal, I thought. No. There is no – first off, you draft the guy in the, in the uh, second round that, that's a wide receiver. The Steelers have a history of drafting good quarterbacks, and I, I don't agree with that at all. I, I, you let them go to Cleveland. You let them go wherever. I don't care. The Steelers have a history of drafting great wide receivers. Don't screw it up. You don't need them. You've got <laughs> talent everywhere. Just let it go. Well, I'll, I'll mention James Washington here in a minute when we talk about rookies we think are going to impress. But I think the window for this opportunity closed when the Steelers signed Eli Rogers last week. Rogers, to me, is a better fit for the Steelers. He knows the playbook. He's not a prima donna. He's not going to compete for eyes and for touches like he would, like Des Bryant would with Antonio Brown. I know Brown tweeted out that he wanted Des Bryant to come play with him. Sure, you say that now, but come November when he has 20 more catches or, or 10 more touches than you have, it's going to be a different story knowing Antonio Brown. So let's not even court the drama. No <laughs> get, let him go to Cleveland. Let him go to Washington, San Francisco, wherever. We don't need him here. Courting the drama is is the Steelers' uh, main uh, export um, besides playing football. <laughs> um, but do you think I, – I, I, I have to think, and maybe I have Steelers-colored glasses. If he did come to the Steelers, I think he would drop the attitude or at least lessen it a whole bunch and stop with the prima donna crap because – No, you, no, no. <laughs> No, I'm sorry. I got to stop you there. There is no way. I mean, we already have Le'Veon Bell, and he's got an attitude, and, and he's a very talented running back. And, you know, his his argument holds water that he wants to play two or more positions. That's great. But if you're going to play wide receiver, you're fourth on the team. And I, I, I don't see them paying a fourth string wide receiver Le'Veon money. Why would you bring Des Bryant in here to kind of say – I'm the man. No, you're not. You might be number three because you're not going to supersede Juju, who legitimately is a very talented wide receiver, has ingrained himself in the Steelers culture here and embraced the city. You're not going to have that opportunity. You're a three, maybe four at best. And Des Bryant, frankly, is kind of on the downside of his career, strangely enough. He hasn't had... More than 69 giggity receptions since 2017. Nice. He had 50 in 2016. He had 31 in 2015 who always hurt. He had eight TDs in 2016, six last year. He's not the elite premier receiver that he thinks he is. You, that does remind me of somebody that did try to prima donna crap last year, Martavis Bryant. How'd that work out for him? Now, I know Martavis is nowhere near had the production, and, and from what you just said, it, Des Bryant's production even was, wasn't even that good. But yeah, the, 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 I, I I could see that. I could see I could see him pulling the the prima donna crap of you know Des would say something like, "Well, I know I'm not as good as Antonio Brown, but I'm good as I'm, I'm better than Juju. I'm better than James Washington. I should be playing more." I could I could easily see him pulling that crap. I agree. Yeah, me too. And don't sleep on Juju. I think Juju is going to have an even better year, and that guy is a treasure for Steelers Nation. Oh, hell yeah. <laughs> well, speaking of the wide receivers, we mentioned James Washington. Let's talk about the rookies. What do you think – let's start with James Washington. What do you think he's going to do this year? you think he's going to be as productive as Juju was last year? I don't think you can be as productive as Juju was. Juju was lightning in a bottle. And I would still say, you know, 35 to 40 receptions for Washington, three, four touchdowns. He's going to stretch the field where Juju's more of a possession receiver. And he made the most of his catches last year. Juju's more of an underneath guy. I think Washington's going to take that Martavis Bryant spot. He's going to stretch the field. He's going to be the big, big play guy. He has to build that trust early on with Ben because we saw with Bryant last year, as soon as he dropped a couple passes, Ben wasn't looking his way anymore. 
And I agree with Jeff Say on that one. I, I think that there's one ball, one quarterback, one decision maker. And I think that Juju built off of the fact he was given opportunities. He was consistently catching the ball. He was a positive force in the locker room. And I, I think he's earned that spot where he's at. And I do agree. I, I think he'll stretch the middle. And I think that they, if you have a secondary there where you have a quarterback that might stare down one wide receiver, how many defensive backs are you choking to one side of the field if another player is on another and they can't stop. You can't stop three great wide receivers and a great running back. You, there's only so many players on the field. So what do you do at that point? I think there's great opportunity from that situation. I think Ben's going to reap those rewards. I Yeah, I'm pretty excited about James Washington. Um, I think the comparison I saw one time was Anquan Bolden. And if he is anything like Bolden, where you throw the ball up and that guy will – will murder anybody around him to catch that ball and just, just outfight anybody. If, if they get somebody like that, that's going to be huge. Agreed. The the exact opposite of Martavis last year, where if you laid a fingernail on him, he he dropped like a pile of bricks. You know, you can't you can't look at Martavis. I think that that's in the rearview mirror. I, I think that Martavis is a, a very talented wide receiver. However, the drug suspensions, the, the, the off-field conduct and other things, he put himself first, and that's his decision, and hopefully he does well for the Raiders. But I, I, I don't think he does well. well. <laughs> What's that? I said, I don't hope he does well. I, 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 I am that bitter fan. I'm that bitter yinzer that if you come out here and you don't perform for us and you're a little pet, petulant toddler who whines about everything, no, go to Oakland. I hope you suck. The uh, I believe the Steelers and Raiders do play each other this year, so that should be fun. That we'll should be that because I think the quarterbacks' uh, comments out there about Ben might might uh, put some fuel to that fire as well. Are we playing? Are we playing in Oakland? Because we always seem to play poorly on the West Coast when we go out to Oakland. I remember a couple years ago that we went out there and just laid an egg, and they were. T- Terrible at the time, but we just couldn't play for some reason. I don't know if it's jet lag. I don't know if the guys are going over to Vegas in the meantime or what they're doing, but they just can't play out in Oakland. Exactly. Regardless of the Raiders, they could be they could be two and thirteen, and somehow they'll play the Steelers and beat them. Exactly, and and then you'll watch Martavis, you know, have five touchdowns or something, and he'll be dancing in the end zone. It would drive me crazy. But do you think James Washington is going to be the big impact rookie, Joey? Yeah, because I don't know what Terrell Edmonds is going to do. I don't know where he sits. I mean, isn't, I mean, technically, I think he's a backup now, although who knows how much they're going to play their sub packages or, or whatever. And I have no idea how this defense is going to end up looking. But, I mean, and, and you, when you get a first-round player – you're not going to just sit him. So I, I have no idea how much he's going to play or how this defense is going to shake out. I think that the Steelers' consistency up the middle, and, and I, I, the cornerback position is very hard in the NFL. However, we don't know what Tomlin's going to play him as. And I, and I, I grow a little bit weary of people automatically saying, oh, this is a horrible pick, or he should have fell to this round, or, I trust the Steelers system. You know, if they were 0-16 like the Browns or if they were in the Buffalo Bills and they were in the middle of the pack, barely make, or the Jets, you know what? We can question every pick. And and it's easy for us as fans to go, oh, the, the sky is falling. We sit on NFL luxury because we have a consistent franchise. Now, if I'm going to pick somebody that might make an instant impact, I'm going to go with the the, the – the fifth round pick, Jalen Samuels. I'm going to go. He could play tight end and running back, and I think there will be a void with Le'Veon Bell holding out. Will somebody step up? I don't know. I, I'm hoping that Connor steps in there. I, I really am because I think that would be a great storyline. We don't know how history is going to play out, with that, but I, I think there's great opportunity in the running back position because I think there are other many, there are many other factors that lead to greatness. You have a great you have a great offensive line. You have great quarterbacks. You have great wide receivers, and I think somebody can pull that void and 
eventually be a good player. You had Bam Morris. You had a couple of average running backs that came in and played like wildfire because they had great people around them. Is Le'Veon Bell great? Yeah, maybe. I don't know. I'm not going to sit here and talk down to a guy that has been a consistent all-star. But I think that there is an opportunity for the fifth-round pick to make a, a, a contribution to the Steelers this year because of the void he's going to leave. I'm going to lean and go and say it's Terrell Edmonds. I think Edmonds is going to be an impact player on defense. I had an opportunity to cover him a little bit when he played at Virginia Tech. And the kid is just a brilliant football player. He understands the game. He picks up on things quickly. And I think he's going to be a big hitter that is going to endear himself quickly to Steeler Nation. Yeah, I'm really excited to see how this defense is going to shake out because, I mean, really – you know, Shazier gone. They really did not find a replacement for him, or did they? You know, is that is that going to be Trell Edmonds? Is that going to be Morgan Burnett? Is that going to be – is that what they're going to do, some hybrid linebacker safety thing? Or who knows? I'm, I'm, I'm really interested to see how it's all going to shake out. I don't think that they're going to really reinvent the wheel. This isn't a Dick LeBeau-led defense as much as I wish it was. LeBeau was the type of coach that he would be able to take a player like Burnett or take a player like Ed, Edwards Edmonds and make them that Troy sort of player where they were a hybrid, where they were a roamer, and they truly felt special. I don't know if the Steelers have that mentality and that coaching acumen that they had with Dick LeBeau. I, I- we have to look past the past. I think LeBeau is a Hall of Fame coach. There's a reason why they went with Butler. Uh, I mean, <clears throat> I'm not going to try to analyze LeBeau versus Butler because that's not fair because I think LeBeau has earned respect eminently as a defensive coordinator. There was a reason why the Steelers went with Butler. We don't know this is a transition year. We don't know how it's going to end up. We don't. Um, if they come up with a new style, people thought the Steelers were nuts when they went with a 3-4, and they, they made it work. If they go back to the 4-3, I don't know. I don't know. I have to give the benefit of the doubt to the front office. Am I crazy in thinking that maybe Butler is the one that should be on the hot seat? Um... I mean, you know, losing Chazier, that just crippled the team. I mean, that just, that, that just crippled the defense. And they really didn't have a, a, a replacement, and the defense suffered greatly. Okay, but you, they are throwing – it seems like every year they're throwing number one draft pick after number one draft pick after, after major acquisition, and – it's always like the defense comes up short. Like how? At what point do you do you blame the defensive coordinator? Well, in terms of draft picks coming up short, I mean, I guess that's a Colbert thing. And you know, you got through a Colbert under the bus. He's he's his track record has been better than not. So I think though, when it comes from a coaching standpoint, I think Butler is on the hot seat. I think that there is the expectation of the Steelers defense returning to that storied Steelers defense of them playing hard hitting impactful defense where they're rushing the quarterback they're forcing the quarterback and the offensive coordinator to make mistakes that they're giving them different looks they're shuffling guys around they're doing different things with Artie Burns they're doing different things with Terrell Edmonds that they're showing a different Mac look that they're going to shifting between a 4-3 and a 3-4. I don't know if we're really set up for a 3-4 anymore. Uh, the, losing Shazier really hurts that look. So maybe you say, hey, we, sh- we should switch things around and we go to a 4-3. It's almost too late to do that. Frankly, it is too late to do that. But that's on Butler. Butler should have been able to look at his per- personnel and say, we need to have a fresh look. He hasn't done that. I don't know what he's done, really. I'm not a big Butler guy. I got to go with Cam Hayward as your your um, 
your linchpin in this whole defense because three four four three he's going to be your center man he he's going to dictate how that game like I'm not going to put him up there with Mean Joe Green but if you look at the play style as how Mean Joe Green could take a game over and block two or three guys at the line and let other people shine I think that's going to be on Cam Hayward that's just me I agree not just Cam Hayward but but to it, especially to it, yeah. really needs a step up. I mean, Cam Hayat had a pretty good year last year, but to it was you know through injury or whatever, just and and, and he has has a big contract too. I mean, and you're right. That defensive line needs to step up. That defensive line is it, it, it all through it all flows through that. The, the linebackers will look bad. The, the, the secondary will look bad if the defensive line is bad. And but if the defensive line is good, then the entire defense looks good. Yep. So, what are we thinking record-wise for the Steelers this year? What do, what do you? How, how many wins do you think they're getting? I'm saying 11 and five. That's going to be good enough for first place in the AFC North. I'll go 12 and four. Yeah. Um, I think the rest. I mean, this is you know one one of the many things I hate about the New England Patriots is they get the easiest darn division. It's like they're given the title every year because the comp, the, the rest of the teams in the AFC East are horrible. I think that's kind of the situation this year. The the Ravens and Bengals are just mediocre. They're maybe seven and nine, maybe eight and eight, maybe nine and seven. That's about it. And Cleveland, bless their heart, maybe they'll win four <laughs> or five games. You know, but, I got I got to call two dark horses out. I think Buffalo. If everything plays out well, I think Buffalo is going to give the AFC East legitimacy. I think the Jets are in chaos. The Browns may surprise. I I truly think that Cincinnati is going to be your tank team this year. I think that Marvin Lewis has let the the, the inmates run the asylum. The Browns have made some – sorry, sorry, I was kidding. The Browns have made some smart decisions this year. I know that pains you to say that, Pip. That's, that's very brave of you to, to actually say something nice about anything in Cleveland. Uh, just, they have, I, I like Tyrod Taylor. I don't think they'll be as good as the Steelers, but I, I. <sighs> Are you okay? Do you no, not. not. <laughs> okay. one. I, I think the Steelers. Should I call 911? <laughs> no, no, I'm fine. <laughs> but I, I do. Oh think that the Browns have made some smart decisions, and I think that Cincinnati is bad, and I think Baltimore is two steps back. I, I, I'm i going to take the Browns for second place this year. And that hurt. <laughs> I'm going to say Browns 7-9. and nine. I think that they're not a 500 team yet, but I think they're going to play much better than anybody expected. They're going to surprise a lot of teams. I bet you the Browns sweep Cincinnati this year. That's my hot take. In terms of Cincinnati, yeah, I'm with you, Pip. I don't think that they're as good as they once were. I think Andy Dalton is extremely overrated. So is Joe Flacco. Um, I think Baltimore has a chance to regress. I think both of those teams will probably end up under 500. It could be, you know, three teams, six and ten, seven and nine records behind the Steelers. Yeah. Yeah. And then. The, the question is, if they go, if the Steelers go, I, I, I think I think eleven and five sounds really good because last year thirteen and three, but come, a couple of those games were you know kind of lucky. But it, it, is that going to be good enough to get maybe that one or two seed in the in the playoffs? Again, it depends on what the Bills do. I, I think the Bills are your your, your question mark team. I, I think they have the opportunity to bring themselves out of mediocrity. I think that if you can get Brady's number and rattle him, you can beat the Patriots, despite the fact that they may have certain advantages. I think the Jets are below average, and the Dolphins, I don't think the Dolphins have made enough moves. I, I think it's all going to depend on the Patriots. What do the Patriots do? Are the do the Patriots go 12 and four? If the Patriots go 12 and four, then they're the number one seed. Do we play the Patriots in the playoffs? If we do, I'm sorry, we're done. We can't beat them. 
I don't <laughs> I don't understand what it is about that team. It's like kryptonite. It's like we're Superman and they're Batman that's got that little thing of kryptonite tucked in their belt and they're going to take us out every time. If we're able to have somebody take out New England and we're playing, I don't know, Kansas City in the AFC Championship game, we're going to the Super Bowl, we'll win it. it who do we run into? Do we run into the Patriots? If we run into the Patriots, season's over. I think this is the year the Steelers actually beat the Patriots, and I'm just basing this off of the Washington Capitals because basically the Washington Capitals of the Steelers and the Pittsburgh Penguins are the New England Patriots, and even this year Washington was able to win. So maybe there's hope that the Steelers can actually overcome the Patriots for once. We need Bur- one year championship. That's all I'm saying. We need Brady to get hurt. That's all there is to it. And I think Pip brought up a great point: is Brady can get rattled. Is the teams when they pressure him and they're able to bring somebody from the secondary and be able to put somebody in his face? He's not as great as everybody says he is. And I know Joey that your dad loves Brady, and I don't want to upset him. But Turn his yeds are carded. <laughs> <laughs> but I think Brady has really just rested on his laurels for a while. And then when somebody actually challenges him, he kind of shrinks away from it. Obviously, he's got a great supporting cast. Uh, This pains me to say this. He might have the best coach in the league and Bill Belichick leading him. So they obviously are still the best team. But I think if you get in Brady's face, if you pressure him and you make him make mistakes, you have a chance to win. Here's what I'm going to say about Belichick. He did not succeed in Cleveland. New England has given him talent. You had smart people in the front office, and as much as it pains me, they are a well-run franchise. When he was in Cleveland, Modell wanted to leave the city. I have been to Municipal Stadium. It was an awful place to experience a game. Can you blame Modell? <laughs> yeah, I do. I, do. I, I blame Modell because I, I – tr- he may have gone to Baltimore and won a Super Bowl in Baltimore. However, he could have had a dynasty had Belichick gone there and he was given the proper talent. I think that Belichick is a coach of the system. I think that he has great people around him, and I think the league has given him certain advantages. I'm sorry. I, I, I will sound like your prototypical Yinzer. I think the league, Jesse James Catch this year was a prime example. That's a uh, catch. It's a catch. The guy has made the, – the, the rule as written was he breaks the plane. It's a touchdown. If you watch it, he's got it, and he bobbles it after the plane. I'm not going to go and look in the past. That's it. It's done. We lost. Sour grapes, what have you. I just think that Belichick has been given good players because he's got good people around him. He has had a solid, solid ownership, which is my original point. Good ownership wins games. Well, I am going to look in the past because I think they could get some hope off of that Jesse James game. Yeah, you know, what was – I think the the final score of that game was like 27-24 or something like that. It was very close, and the Steelers were able to make some adjustments and and do some things differently to to maybe – not rattle Brady, but at least at least make it close and make it competitive. So they're close. They're close to beating New England. So it could happen. It could happen. Uh, it wouldn't be shocking, but I would be mildly surprised if they were able to knock off New England. Like I said, the trick is you've got to rattle Brady and you've got to take them take them off their game. Absolutely, I, they were close in that game of the Jesse James catch. The problem is, is as Pip has said, there's always seemed to be that extra added, there's something else there. That there's maybe the rules are overlooked or bent a little bit in favor of New England. And certainly that is our perception because, you know, as Steeler fans, we've lost to them more often than not. However, there's also evidence that corroborates that, such as Spygate, such as Deflategate. So they're using the mentality of whatever it takes to win, and that's fine. Let's I be just, honest here, Jeff. Say they don't suspend people for a PSI variance in a football. They don't. They had to have something going on behind the scenes, whether it's stolen. 
this is the league that covered up Ray Rice. We don't know what happened behind the scenes. And, you know, whatever is good for the shield, you don't – I'm going to go off on a tangent. You don't, you don't leave cities that are willing to buy whatever you want for greener pastures. I think the moves from St. Louis, Oakland, and San Diego were horrible for the league. I think that money is the ultimate driver, and, hey – but then don't spin around and say, well, why Why is viewership down? Why is attendance down? Why? Are... Well, you can't take away markets that have millions of people that were your fans. I can assure you that if the Roonies decided to leave Pittsburgh, which is highly unlikely, but if they chose to, I would not be a Steeler fan anymore. Do you know why? Because this is Pittsburgh's team. Would the Roonies do that? I doubt it. But I was witness to what happened in Cleveland when Modell left with the Browns. It was heartbreaking to that city. And and the NFL did that to three other cities. And, and, and I think the Chargers are a prime example of what happens when an owner is just money hungry. I think the other thing that you kind of left out there is that our society is losing its attention span. So games that go three hours – I mean, look at baseball. Baseball has lost fans left and right because the games are too long. Football's fallen into that same conundrum that they are broadcasting games too long. Commercials, people pay attention span to watch it. So you're losing all these markets. You're getting people who are just would rather watch the highlights. They're not tuning into the games. That's lost revenue from commercials. That's lost revenue from the broadcast rights and. It's just a perfect storm. I think that they have to find a way to be able to draw the younger generation back in. And I think part of it, too, is this perception that the league's a little bit dirty. Uh, when you look at the other sports leagues, I don't feel as though they have that reputation that the NFL has that there's a team that's perceived as the league's team. I, you can't say that about the Penguins. Maybe Flyers fans will try, but you can't. You can't say that about the Capitals that just won. I didn't feel like the Caps were favored. Good for them. They overcame a lot. I don't feel that way in the NBA. Certainly, that's whoever spends the most money, but I don't feel like the league saying, oh, hey, everybody go to Golden State. That's where we want you to be. The NFL has this perception that they want New England to win, and they have got to get past that somehow. Yeah, I I can't argue that. I mean, it, you know, you see those things of like when the uh, when the refs go to it looks like they're congratulating the, uh, the, the the Patriots. I mean, that's that's not just a Pittsburgh thing. I think the entire league just hates the Patriots and do, do, does think that they get preferential treatment. I think everybody hates Brady, but your dad. My God, I have no idea why. It is a great mystery why he he loves Tom Brady. Like I'm actually worried for him if 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 Tom Brady retires. Like like he's okay with New England. He only watches New England games because Tom Brady's there. But yeah, did he go to Michigan? Did he go to Michigan? He did not. No, I now, have no clue. Now he hates the Steelers because um, when he owned a business. Um, any business that um, is around is open during Steelers Sunday. Forget about it; it's a ghost town. So he hated he hated the Steelers because it, it hurt him, you know, in, in business wise, which which drove me crazy as a kid. But yeah, why he likes Tom Brady? I I that is just a mystery. So my mom, God bless her soul, hated the Steelers because every Sunday my dad was camped out in front of the TV. For three hours or longer. I mean, he watches football like it's his religion. But the Steelers, he was in front of that TV every Sunday. So growing up, my mom convinced me to be a Chicago Bears fan because this is around the time of 83, 84, 85. It was right around the time they won the Super Bowl. And Walter Payton was my favorite player. So my mom convinced me to be a Steelers fan because she went out and bought those starting line players of Willie Galt and Jim McMahon and put them under the tree, and on it, she signed to Jeff from Mike, G from Mike Ditka. I thought for years that Mike Ditka had given me Christmas presents for two years in a row because my mom was trying to convince me not to be a Steelers fan. 
Oh, dead cow. Dead cow, he has some good bears. The bears. The bears. So I came to my senses somewhere around the early mid nineties, but for a long time I was like the only kid in my town that wore a Chicago Bears jersey because my mom would buy it for me because she didn't want me to be a Steelers fan. So I, I understand that mentality, That's Joe. That's amazing. I would I would I wonder if she like learned Ditka's autograph just to uh to, to, to really make it authentic. I don't know. I was like eight, and I told people for years that I got to get my dick from my dick. I was convinced he was like a family friend or something. And it, I had no clue. Ditka claws. Exactly. It was like I don't know if he like FedExed it to us or not. I have no clue. I was also pretty naive because her and my brother, who's quite a bit older than I am, made a spaceship and put an elf stuffed animal in it and crashed it into our tree one year, and I was convinced that Alf crashed into our tree. <laughs> oh, my. Well, on that note, I think we'll uh, we'll call it a night. Uh, this was awesome. Guys, thanks for doing this. Thanks for uh, taking time tonight. Thank you. Right. Joey, thanks for having us. We're, I really appreciate it. It was a great time. Yeah, yeah, awesome. All right. All right, that does it for another show. Thanks again to Lee Mowen, JB Erico, Pip, and Jeff Say. Thank you very much. Um, one other note, if you're wondering the song I use at the beginning of the podcast, it is actually a song called Restaurant at the End of the Universe. It was created by a band called ARO. I don't believe they're around anymore, but it is being performed right now by a band called Gum Band. And they are, you can uh, check them out at thegumband.com. They are one of the best rock bands in Pittsburgh. They do um, rock covers and original songs, and they are awesome. So thegumband.com. So thanks again.